Hi everyone, welcome to the after tea session. Our, nec our next speaker is Laura Richter, who is a, an astrophysicist who used to be at the SKA and now works at Prodigy Finance and she's going to talk about pandas. So when I think of pandas, I think of cuddly bears that sit around and don't do very much and are very sluggish, but apparently she's going to tell us how we can get more out of our pandas. So um, over to you, Laura. Thank you. Um, I, I was a bit overambitious in this talk and I'm running Ubuntu on a Mac and I'm trying to run a live iPython notebook slideshow and my displays went mirror, so we'll see, we'll see. It was all a little bit risky, so we'll see how it turns out. Um, okay, so I'm going to be speaking about pandas, which is a data analysis package for Python. Um, most of the talks I've seen so far, or at least maybe three quarters of them, have mentioned pandas in some way already. Um, which probably speaks to the talks I've chosen to go to, but I, I think it also speaks to the fact that Pandas is becoming an increasingly utilized package. So in the audience here, how many of you have used Pandas before? Oh, I mean, that's ridiculous. Okay, so almost everyone. That was probably like 70%, 80% of you. Okay, great. Um, so that, is, that fact is borne out by the fact that uh, Pandas is the fastest growing Python-related tag on Stack Overflow. So... Um, in terms of all of the Python questions on Stack Overflow at the moment, Pandas is the highest one. Um, and that's kind of attributed to the fact that Pandas is increasingly used in financial business things. So more and more people are using it and they have more and more questions. So Pandas is big, basically, is the bottom line. And so this probably isn't too necessary because most of you use pan Pandas already, but for those who don't, or maybe for those who only use a little corner of the Pandas ecosystem, um, the sort of broad sweep of things that you can do with pandas um, are pretty much everything you would want to do with your data, um, generally. So uh, it has lots of tools for importing and exporting to almost every format you could imagine or need, Excel and CSV and HDF5 and uh, SQL um, and others. Recently at our office we started using um, uh, BigQuery, Google BigQuery, and there's a great interface between pandas and Google BigQuery. Um, that sort of handles schemas for you, it's wonderful, Pandas is amazing, um, and exporting to all of those formats too. And something I learned at the conference dinner actually is that Pandas can also export to LaTeX table. So for those of you writing papers, Pandas can export to LaTeX table, that's amazing, use it. Um, yeah. And then uh, the kind of operations you would commonly associate to databases as well, so things like joining different data sets on columns or indices, and um, grouping and aggregating, so grouping your data by one column or several columns and doing some operations, transformations on that, aggregating the results in some way. Um, sort of generic transformations, pandas provides functionality for doing all sorts of generic transformations on your data. Um, one of the sort of undersold capabilities of pandas, I think, is in handling missing data. So uh, if you use pandas, you probably use pandas on real-life data, and you know that real-life data is full of empty bits um, and gaps, and in other packages, those are such a nightmare, and pandas provides great functionality for making that a lot easier, which is wonderful. Um, sort of Boolean and conditional indexing, where you um, want to select a subset or operate on a subset or um, copy back into a subset of your data, it provides tools for that. There's a lot of built-in maths and stats, which makes life a lot easier. A lot of that is optimized, which we'll see in a bit. Um, there's great time series analysis uh, tools. That's what originally brought me to Pandas, actually. You can very quickly and easily interpolate uh, between missing values and so on. Um, and there's also, uh, Pandas has its own visualization tools, but it also integrates very nicely with other visualization tools. So um, something we use at the office is Bokeh, um, and you can give Bokeh Pandas data frames directly. It all works very nicely together. So that's the broad sweep of Pandas, the useful things you might find um, that you can do with it. So um, one of the things that I really like about Pandas is it sort of tries to be all things to all people in a way. So depending on your data analysis background, um, you'll probably find that Pandas has some sort of similar language or similar mental model that you can draw from for how you've used your data in the past and how Pandas um, represents the data to you. So if you're from a sort of numerical data analysis background and you've been using NumPy, which is my background, then 
pandas looks like NumPy with extra stuff that makes it more helpful. So NumPy with like columns and indices and um, being able to join things and stuff, and that's great. So it draws on that mental model, and you can use the NumPy type functionality. Um, if your mental model of data is more from an Excel background, which for many people it is, then pandas can look very much like that. So it rows and columns and cells, and you do operations on cells with data in them. So that's great. Um, if your background is more SQL, then NumPy also provides that kind of language for interacting with your data and those kind of SQL type or database type joins and so on. Um, so the great thing about this is that it means that, or one of the characteristics of this is that it means that the barrier to entry for NumPy is quite low. So if you've done any data analysis before, um, you can probably jump in and do the same kind of things you've done before in some other package or some other framework with pandas quite easily, which is uh, wonderful, but it sort of comes at a hidden cost. Um, so a few years ago, I needed to buy a microwave, and I went to game, and they had a special on microwaves that also had convective elements, which I thought was great, because then you can like heat pizza in the microwave, and it doesn't go soggy if there's a convective element. Um, so I bought that microwave and I got it home. I was like, oh great, new microwave. I kind of opened the thing, the, you know, the box, and saw the manual and flicked through it, um, and promptly somehow managed to lose it, and got on with my life and used my microwave. And when I decided to like maybe try and use the grill functionality, I looked up from those three buttons I normally use, which is start, stop, and time, to, you know, use my microwave, I looked up above that and there was this like block of all these weird symbols with dots and lines and squiggly things with lines next to them. And I kind of think those tell me how to use the grill, but I don't know how to use them. So I've had that microwave for five years now and I've never figured out how to use the grill, um, you know, which is ridiculous, but it's a sort of hidden cost of something being too easy to use in the way you're used to. So I'm, I know how to use the microwave. I just hit plus 30 seconds as many times as I need and hit start and I open the door when I'm ready. That's all I need to do. Um, but the grill thing, no, I don't know how to do that. I've lost the manual. I suppose I could look it up online, but you know, I'm not going to do that, obviously. Um, so there's sort of a similar analog in pandas with the way, in a way, because, well, any kind of tool like this, because I think you, you know how to do the quick little subset of things that you know how to do that you've done before, and you can do them quite quickly and easily, probably. Um, but the barrier to using the full set of capability is large enough that you kind of um, never get around to or never put in the effort to learn all that stuff. So, um, so in preparing for this talk, I started watching uh, YouTube videos of like PyData talks about pandas, and there's a ridiculous wealth of information. Um, I can't cover like a small subset of it in this talk. I'm just going to do a little bit of it. Um, so, so these are th these are two uh, resources that I drew from. Um, two really great talks: Pandas and Dask from the Inside by Stephen Simmons and Noble Sad Pandas. Um, by Sophia he Hazer. Um, uh, so I'm kind of drawing from these and a few other things just to sort of, you can think of this as like taking a peek back into the microwave manual. So okay, how, how are these things actually working and can I try and understand those buttons a little bit and uh, make things work better for myself? Okay, so first, um, so this presentation is a Jupyter notebook running in slideshow mode, which means that you can actually run code in it, which is cool. But I uh, pre-ran the code because I wasn't brave enough to run it in real time. But just to show you that this is really a live... Oops. Ta-da! So this is live code, hooray. If there's time at the end, I'll show you how um, I ran this in the, the notebook. It's quite neat. Um, great. So, oh. So what we have here is just the imports that we're going to need later. And we're also going to be do doing some profiling of our code by timing it and, and doing some memory profiling and line profiling later. Um, and Pandas provides these really great, uh, oh, not Pandas. Uh, the notebook provides these great cell magics and uh, line magics that let you just uh, run certain commands um, in a line with this uh, percentage sign, and I'll show you later how it works. But you can also use the mem memory profiling and line profiling um, outside of the notebook, just on your normal code. And they're actually fantastic tools, you'll see, um, to test uh, how well your code is doing and to help you optimize it. Okay. Um, so I said that my mental model is built on the fact that NumPy, that pandas sits on top of NumPy. Um, and probably most people know that, and um, 
that is probably the main take home from this talk, pandas is sitting on top of NumPy. And what does that mean? So um, NumPy provides two things to pandas. It's a memory backend and it's a computational backend. Um, as a memory backend, it provides the data structure that our data is saved in. And as a computational background backend, it provides a lot of the um, actual functions that we run, the mathematical, statistical, and so on functions that we run on our data are actually drawing on NumPy. Um, so when you type a dot sum in pandas, it might actually be, draw uh, be drawing from the NumPy um, version of that uh, function. So, ah, uh, it doesn't fit on the slide properly. Oh no, this is terrible. Ah. Uh, how do I get out of full screen mode? Okay. Oh. This is what, what happens when you try and be too clever. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just tell you what's in those. Press zoom. Oh. Okay, oh, but it's not as pretty, but anyway. Um, okay, so here's the beginning of our profiling. Here we're looking at the memory of some of these runs. So uh, what we're looking at here is just um, the advantage that NumPy provides in terms of um, memory, um, being the memory backend of pandas. So if we look at constructing a list and constructing an array of the equivalent um, uh, range just of integers from zero to that number, um, is the memory um, of uh, constructing such a list versus constructing an array like that is, you know, it's about 10 times different. Um, and why is that? The reason for that is fleshed out below, but I'll put these slides up on GitHub so you can look later if you want to, or you can try this yourself. But the reason for it is that um, a as a Python object, a list um, is an object with its own associated sort of metadata and so on, and it points to the elements um, that are within that list, and each of those have their own associated metadata and reference counters and types and so on. And so there's a whole lot of structure around this thing um, that uh, NumPy manages to avoid. NumPy avoids that because in NumPy, what an array is, is it's just a contiguous block of memory of the length of your, or shape of your, or pardon me, length of your data. So say uh, 100 integers um, with a pointer to the beginning um, and information about the shape. So are those 100 integers just one long 100 times one shape or are they 50 times two or are they 25 times four or whatever? But because NumPy uh, keeps the data in that format, it avoids a heck of a lot of the overhead associated to that. So the memory um, uh, requirements for an NumPy array are, as you see here, like radically different. So um, keeping our data in NumPy inside pandas actually gives us a, bi a big uh, memory advantage already. And the second thing that NumPy provides us with is a speed advantage. Um, so here's an example of creating a list here um, of a different range and versus uh, creating, oh, oh, sorry. So we create a list and we create an array of the same uh, type and length again. And then we sum it using the Python sum, and we sum it using the NumPy sum, or just the array.sum, which is the same, really. And um, it's just drawing on the same NumPy um, sum function. Um, and you can see here that uh, from the summing of the list down to the summing of the NumPy array is, again, you know, it's over a factor of 10 um, speed up. Uh, doing the same operation but just the different data structure in the background um, and the uh, different, well in this case using a different computational backend. Um, and say we want to add two to every element of our list, we could do it a little bit Pythonically and do it in a list comprehension or we could just do it in a vectorized way with NumPy. And over here there's a hundred times speed up really from using it, from using the NumPy functions. Um, and that's because of this is vectorized here. And that's because the um, NumPy functions are um, C underneath and they're all optimized for types and so on. So this is just a much faster thing than actually having to loop through elements. Um, using NumPy computationally will always be a gibberjillion times faster than um, using uh, Python directly. So 
pandas sits on top of NumPy, and NumPy provides this optimization intrinsically in terms of the memory and in terms of the, the um, computational speed. So the pandas data structure, you all know this before because you've seen this. Um, if, well, if, if you have been using pandas, you probably, which most of you have. So a uh, data frame has row indices, it has uh, column headings, which are actually also column indices, and then it has data, and the data is typed. If we look at the dot .info here, we see we have a integer, an integer, we have some floats, and we have some strings over here, and internally the strings are objects. And that's because the strings um, uh, can't conveniently be turned into NumPy in the inside, so the strings stay as, um, as Python objects. So I'm going to start looking at um, some examples of this, but the data set that I'll use for the example is the data set um, from our current company. Uh, so I work for a company called Prodigy Finance. We do loans to people who want to study advanced degrees internationally at top schools. So someone from India who wants to study a, um, an MBA at INSEAD in Spain, for example, could apply to us for money. Uh, we might loan the money and they'd go and do the MBA and then pay us back their money. So that's our model. And we have all sorts of different types of data, but amongst the data sets that we have, we have information about the people who apply for loans from us. So I put together a little example data set from our real data, but anonymized and randomized so that it's uh, not a problem. Um, and so we can import that with pandas read CSV. Um, and this is what our data frame looks like. We have a bunch of columns um, that have uh, various information about someone who might want to borrow money from us. So their liabilities in their home currency, uh, the rate you need to convert that amount into uh, pounds, the, their salary over three months, the country that they are habitually living in, the step they are in our process, and various other bits of information. So this is a typical looking data frame with different types um, and rows and columns. Um, one thing you might notice here immediately is that our CSV that we imported was 1.8 megabytes, whereas if we memory profile our import, it's... Uh, 15.93, now that seems insanely bigger than the size of the actual um, CSV that we're importing. And the reason for that is, well actually first, before I say the reason for that, when I was doing some research for this talk, I actually found a formal pandas recommendation that you should have five to 10 times the amount of memory in RAM to the biggest data, um, the biggest bit of data that you want to process with pandas. Um, so this kind of bears that out. But that's quite, a, that's quite a large expectation to have of us nowadays because we work with quite large data sets. And um, to be within um, a factor of two or three of the size of your computer RAM or, or your laptop RAM or the size of the RAM on your sort of T2 instance or something is really not unheard of. So um, having to always ensure that you have sort of 10 times the amount of RAM as you need in your data is quite a stringent requirement. So that's a bit of a fail for pandas actually. But um, the, so the reason that this happens is that um, on the inside, we'll see in the, next, uh, in the next couple of slides, but on the inside of pandas, the data of different types is consolidated together. So although we would have columns of integer float, float, object, integer float, on the inside pandas consolidates types, um, consolidates data of different types together. Um, which is a costly operation actually because what it entails is copying in the background. So you import your data and then you have to copy it into blocks together and that um, can mean that you're copying multiple things. Um. Can people see? Cool, okay, you don't need to see this anyway. Um, okay, so that's that. So, so the thing that uh, deals with all of that in the background is a thing called the block manager, which is apparently going to be um, uh, slowly done away with in, uh, in future releases of Pandas, and Pandas 2.0, they're gonna have different plans for doing that. But for the moment, if you look inside your, um, inside your data frame, um, we can poke around and see what's going on in there. So, if we do a df.info, we see all of our objects, 
And um, now I don't know how to. This is this now is the problem. How am I going to show you something lower down? No, you can't scroll down. Ah, okay. We're just going to go do it like this. Oh, uh, it's because it's in presentation mode. It's like it, the like the screen ends here, in the. <laughs> um, but it's okay. I'll just do it like this. This is fine. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, so if we do dot info and we see that we have about two point one megabytes inside our uh, data, which looks a bit suspicious, if we add a deep is e uh, memory uses the e equals deep, then what pandas does is it goes into the Python objects and um, uh, actually pulls out the um, size of the data within the objects. And then we see that our memory usage is 5.8 megabytes, which sounds more legit compared to the original size of the data we're importing. Um, and just to show you, if you poke around more in the internals and you look at underscore data, this gives us the block manager which is what I was t telling us about. So the block manager has information about the indices, and it has information about the different types contained in the uh, data frame, and um, these blocks will be saved together internally in data structures together. And if we look at the memory usage again with deep is equal to true, um, we'll see that for all of our float and integer columns, uh, these are this is memory in bytes. We have the same amount of memory in bytes for all of them, because they uh, have types of the same size. Um, for our string columns, the data usage is much higher, and that's just because um, of what we're packing into there. And a brief sidebar, actually, is a, a neat thing that I discovered while I was preparing for this talk is the category data type. I don't know if anyone else has used this before, but um, if we have a look at one of those uh, uh, string columns that we have, say something like country of habitual residence, it ha just has two element country codes, in strings. Uh, if we convert those to category type, we'll see that this the memory of this column, which was about 1.1 megabytes before, has dropped to about 55 kilobytes. And what it's doing internally is uh, the category data type is keeping a record of all the unique things and just mapping them onto here. So that's actually a pretty amazing thing. If you have data like ours, you might only have 10 categories and 20,000 rows. So this can be quite a, uh, a big memory advantage if you start using this. So that was just a sidebar. That was a cool thing that I discovered. OK. And oh, oh here, if you look back in the inside, you'll see we now have a categorical block as well. It's a new type of data in here. OK, so we're just going to perform a bunch of different little operations on our data and have a look at um, what works and what works better, what doesn't work so well. So this is a, just a simple slicing extraction of data from our data frame. So here we're taking one column and this range of indices, but we're keeping it as a data frame. That's what the two square brackets do. Over here we're doing the same thing, but we're taking it out as a series. So we're just taking a single column, which becomes a series. Over here, we're doing the same, but we're using uh, one of the pandas indexing functions. And over here, we're, doing, we're getting the same data, but what the dot values does is it pulls out the actual NumPy um, data from the inside. So let's just have a look at the timing here. Um, so the first one, 500 microseconds, okay, down to 60, down to 44, down to 3. Um, so, uh, you know, that's again, that's over 100 uh, times increase just by um, the way that we're choosing to access our data. The reason that this one is particularly slow is that um, it's keeping all of the data structure GAMF that sits on top of the data, so that's very, very slow. I used to actually do this because I thought it was nice to keep the data in a data frame, but actually if you're doing operations on your data, this is slowing, your, slowing yourself down radically, so don't do this um, unless you have a reason to. Um, and Getting the actual values out of the NumPy array internally when you index into them is always going to win a million times. So the first thing to learn here is, um, where possible, use the NumPy data, uh, the NumPy data directly. Oops. Oh. Number one. Number two, so another use case, imagine we want to extract all of the unique strings in one of our categories. So one of our categories of data was pre-study country, where the person lives, 
Um, we're just going to replace the NANs with empty strings just to make the processing consistent throughout these different methods. And then let's try the NumPy unique function. The NumPy unique function on the dot values, on the NumPy data, just um, or extracting the data as if it's a NumPy array into a NumPy array. Um, and let's use the pandas built-in function. Okay, so now we get 8.3, I mean 8.5-ish milliseconds for both of these. You're not really winning here because it's already a string, which is not, pandas can't do anything fancy with that. Um, and the uh, pandas built-in is giving us, what, 300 microseconds. Okay, that's kind of surprising. We might think that NumPy would be doing better, but actually in some cases, the pandas built-ins have been optimized in different ways or actually written, the algorithms written in different ways, and the pandas unique function is known to be faster than the NumPy one. So take home number one, use NumPy data directly when you can. Take home number two, use pandas built-ins directly where you can because they're actually optimized and sometimes work even better than the NumPy ones. Um, so, next example, something that we do very often, is combining columns. So, it could be in a more complicated way, it could be some mathematical operation. Here, we're just going to add them. So, let's think, okay, uh, we might try iterating row by row. You want to add each element per row, then you could maybe just um, iterate with uh, an index somehow and add, add them and append to a new list. Um, you could do the same with uh, pandas built-in iteration. Um, you might think that they would be faster. Actually, in this case, it's a bit slower. Sometimes it is faster, sometimes it's slower. Um, but keep these numbers in mind, so half a second, 1.2 seconds. Then maybe we think, okay, no, let's, let's be more pandonic. And um, <laughs> nobody got my joke when I made that joke the first time. <laughs> um, uh, and, and use an apply. Okay, but that isn't really even winning over, the, over this case, right? And actually, it's because it's sort of doing the same thing. Apply is really actually just iterating over something. Um, then, uh, let's say um, uh, we do an apply, but we pull out series rather than working in the whole data frame um, with all the excess um, structure around it. Yeah, it's a little bit faster, but not much faster. Um, what about if we use the built-in sum? Again, not really helping us very much. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> See, this is, this is, it's hard to look backwards. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the, actually that, so there we go. Actually, that, that's, what, that's better, because that's what you'd expect, right? Pan is built-in, yes, it's winning. Okay, good, a thousand times. <laughs> um, and then the same thing over here, but um, uh, uh, using the NumPy function directly, and these two, sorry, I should have said, these two are about the same, um, because it's pretty much the same thing on the inside. And here we're just gonna use the pandas plus, um, which is even better. And here we're gonna take out the NumPy values and add them, and there we go. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you think you started out with something that was about 1.2 seconds in the worst case, half a second in the best case, and you can get down to 2.2 microseconds, imagine if you could do that for all of your code. Um, that's a radical, a radical advantage. So I won't actually say anything about this because I don't have time, but um, Pandas has the option of being installed with these optimizers, NumExper and Bottleneck. A lot of what they do is actually just giving you speed up in the background, but you can actually use them directly, and it's worth installing them because they do actually give you some speed ups. And NumExper allows you to um, create expressions in, str in strings that are then evaluated um, at once rather than the way NumPy does, which um, has some intermediate steps, and it can actually give you some speed up over NumPy in some cases. Um, maybe I'll just skip this. Oh, do I have another five minutes? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, in that case. Um, so these are just some column operations on a strings, which is a similar thing. It's combining columns, but now columns that are strings. And some of the take-homes here are that the uh, pandas built-ins can be faster than apply, which is no great surprise now, so use pandas built-ins. Um, another thing here is that uh, 
um, again, applies kind of, oh, oh, this is just sort of a naive um, uh, list comprehension, which is the way we're kind of taught to think about things in Python. So you might actually start out with something like this if you didn't know better. Um, do a list comprehension um, with an iterose, and that is super slow. So no, not a good idea. Um, apply, again, as we saw before, gives us quite a large advantage, but then uh, going down to use the data more directly and using pandas built-ins, which is what this kind of thing is, um, gives us massive speed-ups again. So, you know, we do a lot of operations on strings too, and even though it's not um, necessarily NumPy operations now in the background, just the fact that we can vectorize this and use pandas built-ins um, helps us a lot. So, use pandas built-ins, vectorize, um, and NumPy values when you can. Um, so this is pretty much the same example, but just using a little bit more of a complicated um, function. Uh, well, it's not really very complicated, but it's just a matter of combining various bits of information we have about a person um, to find the ratio of their net position to their salary, um, uh, taking into account exchange rates. Um, so it's really just combining columns, but in a more complicated function. And the same kind of... Um, so we get the same kind of results, basically. If you iterate with iteros, it's terrible. It's marginally better with, a, um, with an index, um, but not that much. It's a little bit better with an apply, um, but not that much. In this case, this is a numexpert eval, um, which you can see here. And actually, that gives us quite a big speed up already. And there's some cases where this can be really good. It also um, it uses trigon trigonometric functions and so on you can use in here. Um, so this can give us a really good speed up. Um, and then the next thing is just using the data series directly and vectorizing it and passing them through in chunks. Okay, that's pretty good. That's giving us a good speed up now. And if we use the NumPy values directly, we're down to um, 251 microseconds. So again, it's similar to the same example. Two seconds to 200 microseconds, that's ridiculous. Um, and of course, you won't be able to do that for all your code, but imagine if you could do that for a, uh, for a large fraction of your code. That's the difference between waiting one minute for your program to run and like two hours. That's ridiculous. Um, and just quickly to show what's happening here. So this is a line profiler um, that's running on the functions we show, showed above. This is the apply. Um, this is uh, vectorizing, but just using the panda series. And this is vectorizing with the NumPy expression, uh, with the NumPy values. Um, and over here, we can see it took about 0 0.02 seconds. And the time is being spent by multiple hits to these functions, which is really what apply does. It's just looping through. So there's 20,000 loops for our 20,000 rows. That's why it's being so slow. Um, if we move here to the um, vectorized version, we see there's only one hit. Okay, and that's why we're winning so much there. And uh, to the vectorized version that's using NumPy data, there's one hit, but the actual time per um, operation is faster too. So we're winning on both counts in that case. Um, and I will leave this one, but it's basically just showing that you get the same kind of thing for if. Um, you can use an apply. Don't do that, it's slow. You can use the built-in dot where, that's faster. And actually in this case, if you use the NumPy where, that's the fastest of all in this case. It's not always the case. Your mileage will vary depending on the type of thing you're trying to do in your data. But um, the, uh, the NumPy functions directly can uh, give you a lot of speed up too. Okay, so this is my summary. NumPy, know that you have NumPy in the background and use it. Use your NumPy data where you can, where appropriate. That'll give you a massive speed up already. Number two, use pandas built-ins. Um, you know, it, it sometimes it seems too simple to be uh, efficient, but actually they're designed well, so use them. They could give you a lot of speed up too. Um, and number three, vectorize. Vectorize will always, vectorizing will always give you a massive speed up. Eh, why are you not working? Oh, anyway. Oh, oh, it's down here. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, Iter items and iteros are for special occasions. You might find reasons that you need to use them. You might find reasons that you need to use apply. Like maybe you actually need to do some function that needs to call something else, and you just need to loop. If you need to loop, you need to loop, but it's for a special occasion. Otherwise, avoid them. Uh, user performance optimi optimizers. Look under the hood. Um, there's lots of convenient profiling tools. They'll make your code better. 
And there are more sophisticated optimization mechanisms if you read them, if you need them, like Siphon and um, Number and so on. And imagine that you can get a thousand times speed up from just writing your code in a slightly different way. That's pretty cool. The end. Um, yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, that was great. I learned a lot and looking forward to trying some of these out on, on Mike Panda's code. Um, we've got about five minutes for questions. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Nice talk. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, with, with the extreme memory requirements and all you have, have you investigated um, other options such as um, running these things on Spark or distributed data frames like DDF.io, any of those things, just out of curiosity. I, I personally, I haven't needed to yet. We, we, d we have hit, we hit memory um, problems with some stuff we were doing a few months ago, but uh, you know, we could just up the size of our instances so we didn't actually have to. But absolutely, if that, was a, you know, if that was part of your project and you have to, that would be cool, we would do that. Anyone else? Very nice talk, thank you. Can thank you, you quickly explain again what you did with set option to save memory? Set option to save memory? Where was yeah, that? Yeah, did I see correctly there? You s uh, said that you, ca you got to save a lot of memory by using something with sets. Oh, categoricals. categoricals. Oh, yeah, it's just a, it's just a pandas data type. Um, it's, it's quite cool. I just discovered it while I was doing some research for this talk. So, you know, most pandas on under the hood is NumPy data type, so it's, you know, an int, NumPy dot int or whatever. There's also a pandas data type called a uh, category, um, which seems to keep a list of all the uh, unique things in your um, column and then just map those onto the um, individual items in the background for you. Um, so it can be a lot smaller because it just has the unique things and then a mapping to the um, to your data. And y to convert it, you just need to do an, a dot as type category. It's as easy as that. It's like converting to an integer or converting to a float or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, equivalent to, a I think, a factor in R for those who might be familiar with that. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, I was just wondering if you performed similar profiling uh, using the data set in R um, out of interest. I've never used R. I've heard it's amazing, but um, I've I, I grew up in pandas. So I mean, I grew up in Python, so that was that was what motivated my choice. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you can share this notebook because there's some things that I've probably missed while watching this. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put it up on GitHub after this. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Great. I think that seems to. You yeah, have about covered it. Let's thank the speaker again. Cool.